Up next is Collective Leadership in Documentary and the Arts. This panel was organized by Rahi, Rahi Hassan. They worked really hard on this. They're a formerly undocumented cultural organizer, impact producer, and multimedia documentary artist challenging power on all fronts to create space for healing and radical imagination. Rahi will be joined by filmmakers Mikael Key Francois, Jazz Franklin, Ade Oni, Rihanna Sege and Rihanna Sige. Please tell me if I mispronounced any of your names too. Um, please correct that whenever you get up here. And so without further ado, I will pass it over to these panelists to kick off our conversation. Thank you so much, Sandashe. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're so excited to share space with you all. Um, we are, we have 60 minutes and it's five of us. Uh, we will be, um, we kind of just wanted to share, open this, uh, create space to talk about collective leadership. So we'll be sharing um, our learnings and our experiences from um, our um, uh, different collectives we are involved with and um, things that, you know, um, have, um, that, that, that are relevant to the discussion of like, what does collective leadership look like? Um, in especially in the arts or community projects and documentary. Um, we'll also share like the structure and formats of how our um, individual collective, um, collect how our collective operates and how that leads to like building um, power um, with, with like collective lead uh, leadership. So we'll uh, go and introduce ourselves and share a little bit about our personal work um, and then we'll dive deep into the conversation. We might not have enough time for a formal Q&A. Um, I'm not sure if you all have access to a Q&A box below. If you don't, um, we'll try to save like five minutes at the end of the conversation um, for if you have any questions, you can post them in the comment section. Um, so my name is Rahi Hassan. I use they, them pronouns. I'm currently in the occupied land of Lumbee and um, Shakori, also known as Durham, North Carolina. Um, to be mindful of accessibility, I will verbally describe my appearance. Um, I am a non-binary um, femme presenting South Asian person with light brown skin and black hair. I am wearing a um, uh, um, dark blue and white striped uh, sweater. Um, behind me is a um, cream uh, wall. And um, so I am a filmmaker. I am an impact producer and a cultural organizer, also an arts administrator. Uh, I work at the uh, Center for Documentary Studies, coordinating the continuing education program. I'm also the co-founder of Undocumented Filmmakers Collective, I also work as a consultant um, for a documentary organization in Dhaka, Bangladesh um, called Dhaka Doc Lab. And um, I'm currently, I'm from Bangladesh. Um, I was born there and I uh, lived there until I was 14, um, then moved to New York City. I was undocumented um, for 19 years until a couple of years ago. And um, I uh, currently, yeah, these are, these are the things I'm doing. I'm also working on a couple of projects, um, a short film about, um, my mother who um, carved uh, a libert liberatory path um, for herself through poetry. And I'm also working on a film um, about my undocumented journey through the lens of uh, my childhood growing up in Bangladesh um, during uh, the rise, uh, a rise of patriarchal violence in the 90s. So um, later on, I'll be sharing more um, how uh, my work led me to um, uh, collective work and um, also um, my learnings from the Undocumented Filmmakers Collective. I will pass the mic on to Jazz. Awesome. Thank you, Rahi. Um, I, I'm Jazz Franklin. Uh, I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm based in... Uh, New Orleans, which was occupied um, by the Homa and Choctaw, and I think several other uh, Native American tribes. Um, it's the land was called Bulbancha. Um, also, want to pay homage to the Black people who are enslaved here, who also built the city of New Orleans. Um, uh, so I'm here representing Patois, uh, which is a 
collective of about six or seven folks. Um, and we put on a film festival every year, or at least try to, sans COVID, <laughs> um, that centers human rights and grass, grassroots movement building. Um, I'm also a part of a network of artists called Gallery of the Streets um, that seeks to transform everyday spaces into sites of resistance. And um, yeah, and then otherwise I'm a, a freelance doc filmmaker. Uh, so I'll pass it. I don't know actually who I'm supposed to pass it to. Let me check. Pass it to Rihanna. Okay, Rihanna. <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Rihanna. I'm originally from Kansas City, Missouri, but I'm based in Atlanta, Georgia. I am a filmmaker and photographer. I am a part of a collective called The House of June. We are a group of filmmakers that uh, create stories based on black and brown people in the South. Um, I am lucky and fortunate to be a part of a group of women who create stories to include a lot of stories that's not being told. So. Oh, someone said love House of June. Thank you. Hey. So um, yes, I'm a part of the House of June. I've been doing filmmaking since 2015. Um, I graduated from Clark Atlanta University and I was so happy to link up with the House of June and it's been creating great work ever since. So I'm gonna pass the mic off. Hey, peace. What's happening, y'all? My name is Mikael uh, Kai Francois and I am uh, I was born in New Orleans, so representing all the charity babies, charity babies represent. Um, I am a West African man in the diaspora by force. Uh, my skin is a chocolate brown, milk chocolate, and I have a full beard with a shaved head, and I'm wearing a blue shirt with tiny uh, red roses and white flowers. Um, my background is in community organizing and union organizing specifically, um, and also with working with progressive communities of faith. Uh, I was a chaplain, I uh, was a preacher. Uh, I practice African traditional religions uh, right now, but formerly served in uh, a mainline Protestant um, Christian denomination. Uh, after going to seminary, I decided to try and merge all of my gifts into movement rooted uh, radical film work. I see film as an organizing tool to build power with our communities, our communities being uh, Black and Indigenous folks of color um, and also queer folks. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Root Story Films, uh, which is a movement aligned a film collective that was uh, started in 2017. It was co-founded by uh, myself, Safia, uh, Spence, Zoe, and Alexi. Um, we still rocking together in various ways. And um, we write, um, edit, and film work, uh, usually in collaboration with nonprofits, but also just in collaboration with fly ass people um, who bought this work. Um, we are really excited uh, to see leadership as uh, leadership in this industry as one that is occupied by principles and to try and use those principles, not to talk about it, but to be about it. Um, so I look forward to digging into some of the things that um, some of the ways we try to live into those principles, right, um, in, in ways that are not theory, but that are praxis based. Um, I like to say that um, that praxis is what theory looks like when it grows legs and walks in my community. So some of that looks like for us in a really practical sense, uh, reparations, um, not like reparation petition or reparation, um, you know, value statement, but reparations in my pocket. Um, that looks like um, folks being able to step into whichever type of role they want to be in from production to production. So that is, if you're a, a director on one project and the next project you want to be on camera, let's make it do what it do. Everybody's going to, you know, uh, lean in to try and support you in that role. If you want to be an editor on the next project, um, that's also a possibility. Um, and so uh, I'm interested in also just hearing from other folks as much as I can. And um, I'll drop my info in the chat so that hopefully, you know, the connections and relationships can continue to grow. Thank you all so much for your work.
and I'm passing it now to a day. Hey, y'all are so dope. Um, peace, everyone. I'm a day. I use they, them, sometimes she pronouns. Um, and I'm a Afro surrealist and multimedia healing artist. So. I do work through film and experimental video. Right now, I'm really sharpening my skills in sound production um, as a textile artist and a, an herbalist, a plant worker. Um, and so I am, oh, just quick description of myself. This was kind of fun to write out a little bit beforehand because I was like, how do I describe myself to the people? So um, I said, you know, cute, quirky, a uh, gender non-conforming femish black person wearing translucent blue glasses, um, a burnt orange top. And I have like a windowed background with some house plants scattered through. Um, and some of the collective work that I'll be bringing to kind of talk about are with Art Asylum. It's a collectively driven web of artists um, living with and loving through mental health challenges. Um, so we create sliding scale, low to no cost creative resources and gatherings that affirm our bio and neurodiversity. Um, and then also the North Carolina Mutual Aid Herbal Apothecary that was really formed as an intuitive response and offer to the pandemic, um, really stewarding a plant-based space that BIPOC medicine makers and um, Black folks, our community, can access um, earth medicine and, and really heal on their own terms. And something that I just wanted to point out when I was just thinking through how weaves together is this common truth that connects us, that story is medicine. And so as filmmakers, as artists, um, working through story to heal with our communities, I think I'm really excited that that is where we're weaving together. Just story being this kind of um, reminder of us being part of this greater ecosystem and cosmic reality. And so healing being just the center of everything that we do, um, whether we realize it or not. And I definitely see taking back control of our narrative and control of what health looks like, control um, around what absurdity actually is, is a, is a power that I access through my collective work, through my work as um, a multimedia artist, um, so I'm, I'm excited to, to dig into that more with y'all. Thank you, glad to be here. Thank you, Ade. Um, if, if anyone has forgotten to verbally um, describe yourself, feel free to do that when you speak next. Um, yeah, so um, I'll share a little bit about um, um, how I came into, I guess, collective leadership work. Um, so Undocumented Filmmakers Collective formed um, kind of from the need of um, acknowledging that, um, you know, undocumented creatives were sort of um, just looked at as sources of stories and not creators of stories. Um, and um, there are, you know, scattered undocumented filmmakers all across the country that um, were excluded from um, resources because of uh, due to citizenship status requirements. So whether it was funding or film festival or other kinds of resources, um, not only just for film, but other, you know, um, art mediums. Um, and there wasn't necessarily like advocacy happening for that. Uh, perhaps we were trying to advocate for ourselves. Um, and so, you know, it was a group of us that came together um, to um, that, that led us to understand um, just uh, the power of, um, you know, being together and having, creating a lot louder voice um, to, be heard for uh, the needs and the struggles of undocumented filmmakers. And um, a lot of the folks in the collective currently, um, it's a 40 plus member um, collective um, filmmakers from over a nine to 10 states. And um, 
you know, very quickly we, um, we, we acknowledge that it's not, um, you know, despite our shared identity, identity of being undocumented and our shared experiences, um, we're not a monolith, right? So for us to um, work together to support each other and um, create, um, advocate for resources for undocumented filmmakers, um, uh, we needed to understand um, and create a space that was safe and autonomous for each of us, right? And I think um, when I first came into film, um, I also come from a background of social justice, activism, community organizing. And, um, you know, I came into film not um, really, I didn't actually go to like a formal film school. And um, I came into film from to use film as a tool for social change. And um, I started, um, I guess like, you know, the social change work that I'm trying to do is liberatory work, um, liberation for all and um, for us to especially marginalize people to um, find our power, right? Find our freedom. And so when I saw in, um, I came across a lot of extractive storytelling practices. And as I was, um, kind of um, trying to find alternative um, or to like challenge or understand um, um, the history of like, I guess, um, extractive storytelling. Um, I came to realize that a lot of it is um, due to even the hierarchical um, structure that um, is in like embedded in the filmmaking process. Um, for me, um, it has always been, process has been, intentionality and process has been like a, um, I would say a common theme for any work that I'm trying to do. And so I tried to dig more into the process um, of filmmaking and came across like, there's just so much, um, yay, Rihanna is back. We we're not able to see Rihanna before. Um, the process, that um, like, I guess like when we just kind of think about history of documentary where it was inherently like a very colonial practice um, where privileged people are like a white man that had access to buying uh, a camera and then pointing it toward, um, you know, marginalized people and telling, telling those stories. Um, it, um, so if we're trying to challenge that, I think if we're trying to decolonize documentary, we need to um, figure out how to decentralize leadership, um, whether it's um, the relationship between the storyteller and whose stories that are being told, um, or, um, you know, if there is a power play within the process of filmmaking, um, that can also reflect in how the story is being told. So having said all of that, I think when we came together in the collective, um, we um, realize that the work that we're trying to do, advocacy and artist development for undocumented filmmakers, we wanted to unlearn this uh, systematic uh, oppressive practices that we are trying to challenge ourselves. So how do we not reinforce those practices, right? And I think a lot of that, um, a lot of the time when we are trying to unlearn something. It is it is time consuming. It is a new practice that we're trying to learn. Um, but I think for our collective, we were committed um, and intentional about um, doing that. Also, um, acknowledging that the um, this is a our collective undocumented filmmakers collective is a collective of all filmmakers. We came together to be able to make films, and we're all in the same field kind of um, uh, applying for the same um, funding or um, same resources. So we wanted our um, value to be elevation, not competition. And also how do we all rise together? So with those values, when we all collectively committed to those values, um, the form, the structure, all of that kind of organically shaped because um, we, yeah, we wanted to make sure that um, each of us are feeling empowered in the space and we are um, not hoarding, um, you know, um, any um, like skills or knowledge. How do we um, 
share everything we learn with everyone. So um, just to share a little bit about like um, the operational structure for the collective, we um, are we have like five subcommittees for our collective that um, includes um, career and mentorship, PR and visibility, community organizing, film festival, funding and development. And each subcommittees um, have um, uh, leaders that are in rotate, rotating positions. And um, another thing around collective leadership that I think is unique for, um, unique from like hierarchical uh, leadership structure is transparency. Um, and I so we use like a, a platform called Slack where all um, all the decisions that get made made within the institute within the organization are all of those information are accessible by every single collective members. Um, we also um, um, use con consensus based decision making process for all the decisions that we make. Um, I'm going to pause here and pass it on to um, Mikael um, and then I'll, I'll share more in a little bit. Hey, y'all. Uh, so uh, y'all is my favorite word. So you're probably going to hear it a lot. Uh, <laughs> I, um, as I said, I uh, am part of a collective called Root Story Films. I also co-run um, another full service production house called Voice Razor uh, with my homie Spence um, that does similar work around aligning with uh, movement uh, rooted uh, organizations and just dope people. And uh, part of um, what collective leadership looks like um, in practice for both of those platforms for us really starts out with an analysis of power. Um, and so, um, you know, while we know that we are, we are looking for ways to uh, dismantle, but ultimately create other systems um, that render those oppressive forms of power obsolete. So I don't, I don't want to spend all my time trying to tear something down. I prefer to take the approach where I'm just going to build something up, right, that honors my community, that honors my ancestors, um, that makes a way, you know, for the next generation, um, and just try and reorient um, the, the practices within the organization um, to building something that is just going to render old whack ass systems as obsolete. Um, so that is the approach that um, I uh, aspire to take. Um, and so some of that looks like when we recognize the different types of power that folks hold, um, they are, uh, I'm the, in Root Story, I'm the only Black person in the crew. Right, there are other folks in the crew um, who have different positionalities, um, and you know we are very aware that when we need to leverage, uh, say, a white person's power in the group, we are very explicit about that and saying, "Yo, you need to step up and handle this because it's too dangerous." Either you know politically, professionally, whatever it is, um, and so knowing that. Um, power is something that is very much uh, alive and well. Um, we try to be really honest uh, with each other and with the implications of the different ways that we wield power or don't wield it. For decision-making processes, uh, one of the things that we have uh, that we have utilized and found helpful is the like fist to five technique, um, which um, uh, for us which can be tweaked. For us, it means if you're a one on something, there's a decision, what bank are we going to use? That was a big decision for us. If you're a one, that means that's a heck no. That's a, it's not going to happen, bro, at all. We're not doing that. Um, if you're a five, that means you're like, woo, woo, yeah, let's do it. Um, and then there are all those places um, in between. And um, even though, uh, we have found that that is not a clear cut way to fully express um, our voices. It does help get a sense of where folks are and then we do additional um, processing. So that's been helpful. Um, another thing that's been helpful 
um, as far as leadership is, instead of seeing leadership as embodied in a single person, uh, we look at leadership as the principles are leading. And we are trying to embody those principles. One of the ways that that, excuse me, one of the ways that that looks is in the way that folks are, are paid. Um, and, um, and in the way, again, that you get to step into whatever position, usually films are very hierarchical. Again, you can move uh, from project to project based on what position you wanna be in. Nobody is expected to know everything and nobody knows everything. Um, and so our job then becomes for that project, how can we support you if you wanna be an editor on this, even if you've never done editing? How can we buddy up so that you can do that editing? And so then the leadership ends up looking like a responsibility and accountability to both individual development, but also collective development, right? There's no one without the other. You know, if, if I'm whack <laughs> and you super fly, then both of our shine is like being dim, you know what I'm saying? But if we can just both shine, then we really doing the damn thing. And so um, y'all know I'm from the NO, so you know my words might be a little cayenne, you dig? So don't worry about that. Um, <laughs> but we, uh, it, it is both a, a challenge and um, a challenge and one of the most rewarding things that, that we have done. Um, another, uh, re regarding money and resources, uh, I mentioned reparations, and that is there was a percentage that's assigned to each person based on their multiple identities, race, class, blah, 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 all these different ways, both we are seen and that we see ourselves. And there's a percentage assigned um, to each person. And then we have different little pots. Um, I like to think of them as gumbo pots. Um, uh, we have different pots um, to recognize all the different ways that work is done, right? And so there is a pot where money is taken out of um, certain people's um, rates to account for the work that women folk and femme folk are constantly doing. Um, and that's one pot. So if you're a woman or a femme, then you get work, you get some sort of monetary compensation for that emotional labor that you are always doing, always, hands down. Um, and then there's another pot for queer folk where, you know, you're doing that work too. And then there's a pot for uh, black folk. Well, that's just me since I'm the black person in the crew. Um, and so we have the, and then there's an indigenous sovereignty pot. So we are taking out, um, we're taking out different percentages of money from our individual rates based on all of those intersecting identities um, to account for those things. And money is not the only thing, but in this time, in these times, money is a big thing. Uh, because as much as I love principles, my utility company, they don't wanna hear about my principles. They want their bread, I'ma be in the dark, you dig? That my rent, they don't wanna hear about that mortgage, they need that bread. Um, and so that is one of the ways that we just try to apply principles to lived experience. And again, it's not the end all be all, it's very sloppy and messy. Um, I'll just say one more thing because I, I think it's time for me to pass on, but the work of the, the initial work of designing what that um, reparations and emotional labor policy look like uh, myself and the other person of color in the collective, we decided that the white folks needed to do that work, right? Like first we, we were doing it and it was like, why are we spending our time? No, they, they, they need to fix this, right? Like they need to fix this. Um, and so they went, did some research and came back to the entire collective with a proposal. And then we tweaked it, tweaked it, tweaked it. They did some more work on it. The white folks did some more work on it. They came back with another one. And then after it was something that we felt was cool, then we voted to accept it. Um, so it was definitely some back and forth. And this can look very different depending, of course, on the composition of your collective or your work or whatever. I think there's all sort of ways to chop and screw it. Um, but one of the things that I love about collectives is that um, 
I can't think of many other places where you can create systems um, you can you can create systems immediately, not by and by when the morning come, right? Because there's too much at stake for all of that, um, right? I need I need solutions now. I need to be safe now. I need to feed my family now. You dig? I need to develop my skills now. And so, to collectives have enabled me to be able to um, to manifest some of those things um, immediately, um, which, which is important for me. And I think urgency. Um, urgency, uh, looking for responses um, that respond in, uh, in proportion to our lived experiences um, is, is critical for me. Uh, so uh, with that, I think I'm a um, pause for the calls and uh, just hear some of the other wisdom in the room. Appreciate y'all. Hey everybody, I'm back. Uh, just wanted to pretty much piggy piggyback off what uh, Mikael was saying. So once again, everyone, my name is Rihanna and um, we're talking about filmmaking, right? And we're talking about collective leadership. So part of our, uh, the House of Dreams, part of our theory is when we're creating stories about black and brown people, we have to be inclusive of the cultures that we're creating for, right? So as a filmmaker before, we created a lot of stories and we were creating a lot of, uh, projects that just didn't seem like it was getting to the root cause of uh, the story that we were trying to tell. So we had to take a step back. And as a first AD, as a director, because we, first of all, we shared different positions within the group. But as these positions, we had to tell each other like, hey, baby, yeah, that story ain't sitting right. You have to pull somebody from the community in here to get that right. And just for clarification, I am a black woman from Kansas City, Missouri. I was raised in a very tough neighborhood. I, I'm a proud ghetto girl and I moved to the South to celebrate who I am and where I'm from. I don't sugarcoat how I talk. I don't try to present myself as nothing else. So as a filmmaker, that's how we approach things. We created a project one time and we were doing casting and we were talking. The director was like, I really like this girl, but I don't know, Rihanna. I was like, mm -mm, mm -mm, baby, she is not from Atlanta. And this was a Atlanta based story. So, if you know, if you're from Atlanta, you're from the West Side or somewhere from Atlanta, you know, the accents are thick. The girl was probably from California. And they were like, she has the look. I was like, but she doesn't have the soul. And as a collective, we had to have that conversation. Like, hey, girl, you can't do that. I have to hold, just how I'm quick to hold a white person responsible for uh, their actions, I have to hold us accountable too. You can't tell a story without the people. And if you're gonna put people in certain positions and expect for them to thrive when you started them off on a bad foundation, it falls back on you. So when we talk about collective leadership, that's one of the ways that we address things in our writing. We make sure that if we're writing a story or we're telling a story, we're, we're living that life. I can't write about another um, ethnic group that I have no clue about without consulting them first, making sure that my facts are straight. And I'm gonna hold everyone on my team accountable. I'm like, hey girl, you sure they talk like that? Like I am West, I'm originally from, well, my mom, my mom's Jamaican and my father is Sierra Leonean. So I hold a privilege too, that even though I was raised in the ghettos of Kansas City, Missouri, baby, you, you ain't had the problems that the rest of the black folks ain't had. Your problems started in 1993. Yours didn't come 400 years ago. Even, even if the lineage somewhere got mixed in, I know my privilege of not being true, truly, truly from America. So I hold myself accountable when I also speak about black life and I guess the things that happen in my neighborhoods or to make sure that I'm not becoming a, like a caricature of what black is. So if I can see it, I'm gonna make sure everybody else can see it. I'm like, oh, someone's like, this is this conversation that a lot of us, um, a lot of people use. They're like, oh, that's ghetto. And I'm like, why, why do you keep saying that? Like, why do you refer to something as ghetto? If one, you've never been in one, and I'm like, oh, you, you never experienced it. But a lot of non-black folks, that's their favorite thing to say, right? Oh, that's ghetto. So when I'm in the hoods of any city, I show my respect because you never know where you are. You never know these people's stories. So you, I, my hood is way different than Atlanta's hood. Like things I won't allow in Kansas City, things I pop off of, I'm like, girl, you might get shot in this city. You, you have to be careful. And I make sure I tell that with the collective. And the collective, first of all, they some bomb ass black women. So they already know what's up. But 
it's still they'll still hold you accountable like yo re be careful when you say that are we greet everybody the brother and sister as creators as filmmakers we hold everyone accountable even ourselves our talent we hold them accountable when we go cast or when we cast or when we pick up crew sometimes we go right in the street of atlanta and we're like hey y'all want to learn how to create films it's not always about going to find fly somebody in from la there's people right on your corner who don't have a dime you pay them what you was gonna pay somebody else because you can teach anybody to be a pa baby you can do it so collective means literally adding people in like we're a group, but we make sure that everybody learn. Like you, you can't just expect a collective, uh, like a collective to, to only talk about things like, oh, it's just filmmaking. It's just us three. We just do it. No, you bring in the neighborhood. You bring in the community. The people you write about. The people you talk about. I would be very. Okay, we see it all the time. You see white filmmakers that create films about black people. You like black people don't talk like that. Where do they find these? These proper black people. Where are these where are these black people from? This is about the hood. So you have to make sure that when you tell these stories you're inclusive and that we're also being inclusive when we tell our stories now i don't want to uh, keep on going on but it's just just wanted to say my little part and <laughs> now i'm gonna pass the mic on i, I can go um word word to everything that everyone said uh, i think this is a powerful panel um so Patois started in 2004 um, by a group of artists, activists, and organizers. And um, it was, you know, these folks had their ear to the ground in grassroots movements. And they saw a gap between the movement building that was happening on the ground and then what people were seeing in theaters or you know, how to get a message across to a large group of folks in uh, the city of New Orleans. And also um, the, the issues that we uh, focus on are human rights based. So um, you, for instance, uh, we showed a film in 2017 called Whose Streets by Sabah Folan and Damon Davis. Um, we showed uh, Not In My Neighborhood by Kurt Olderson. Um, and just recently we showed this film uh, like Sunday called um, uh, Afro Brothers Spaceman in the Day the Earth Stood Stupid. And all these films are written and created by the people who the film is about. So Sabah Folan from Whose Streets is an activist and an artist. Um, Kurt is also an organizer, and um, uh, and uh, John Slade, who is the animator, is a political cartoonist for this uh, film called uh, Afro Brother Spaceman. And basically, I say that to say that what our focus is is not on necessarily the it is the subject of human rights, but it's also the process of how we how the film is made. And all those films were made in kind of this shared leadership way. And, um, and so that's really our focus. Some tools that we bring from uh, as a collective to uh, really push a decolonial practice is um, small D democracy. So we all sit in a circle well, pre-COVID. <laughs> You know, and I'm sure a lot of you already do some of these things and maybe don't attribute it to like uh, black feminist praxis. So sitting in a circle talking to each other is much different than sitting in a boardroom where you're faced, you know, where the person who's usually the head is like usually standing at the head of the table, you know, so we practice decolonizing space like that. We also um, practice uh, consensus where we try to very hard. <laughs> where uh, we make decisions where everybody agrees. And if one person doesn't agree, we have to figure out what, what do we have to do to make sure that um, if this person doesn't agree, how can they feel comfortable with moving forward? And or what are some red flags that are being raised as to why this person disagrees with this um, decision? You know, um, so collective decision making is a, a really important i think to decolonizing and building shared leadership because when you hear everyone's opinion that also means that somebody has to have an opinion right <laughs> you can't just default to leadership and i think uh it builds trust and comradeship 
in what you're building, you know? Um, and uh, I think the final thing that I'm gonna say is something, um, something was brought up around how expensive film is. And, um, and I think the other day we were talking about to the, uh, the archive, like stock footage and, and who has access to that. And I think as people who deal with the moving image, I think it's really important as we reclaim our stories and, and tell them back to people that we understand that, you know, sometimes we, we are archiving our own stories. You know, the, the, the film that you make outside that you think is like totally shitty, keep that, you know, because that's your archive of what's happening in your life that somebody 50 years from now could look at. And it's not held hostage by the Smithsonian, you know, I mean, no, no shade to museums, <laughs> no shade. But, you know, I think that, um, I think that sometimes when you have to pay or go through all of these steps to get access to something that's yours, um, a decolonial praxis is to make your own, you know? Um, so that's, that's pretty much it about Patois. I'll pass it to Adi. Yeah, go ahead. Wow. Um, yeah, so again, I think that Art Asylum and the Herbal Aid Mutual, um, the Mutual Aid Herbal Apothecary Project, they're both kind of committed to this thread that we all share on this panel around um, story as medicine and using film and storytelling as a site of transformation, of disturbing, um, kind of heteronormativity. And so we're just really interested in how we recoup our narrative of power around what heals us. And I just, everything you said just now, Jazz, about um, consent, consent-based decision-making is so powerful because the core value there is around consent and around honoring no's and kind of figuring out and like really feeling the yeses and um, and cultivating intimacy with each other. I mean, the work that's being created is being called up from deeply vulnerable imaginative spaces. And so it is important that when we're circling up, um, whether it's to like meet or work on a new project that we are, that we're able to be vulnerable with each other, that like our walls are able to come down because that is where the, the liberation lives in vulnerability. It lives in um, being able to access that radical imagination. And it's hard to do if you don't feel safe in a space, if you don't feel like you really connect with the people you're working with, if, you know, for whatever reason, you're feeling like you need to have a mask on. Oh, that was not a pun. <laughs> Definitely wear your bass. Um, but <laughs> so, yeah, just wanting to lift up the healing work that I feel like is at the center of what all of us are kind of coming to filmmaking and art to do. And it, it's not even with that as our, as our organizing principle, like a hierarchical collective structure just doesn't make sense. Um, and doesn't actually serve the work we're trying trying to to create. It, it's kind of the antithesis of what we're trying to create. So, for example, Art Asylum, our structure is somewhat decentralized, and so there's kind of a core stewardship group, and then um, each of us have different projects that we're holding and come together to organize support around, to get feedback on, which I think is awesome. And, and it took different evolutions to realize that um, maybe we don't all have to be doing the same thing or like what are the different gifts we're bringing to the circle and how can this space be a place that um, nourishes those gifts and encourages us to like go out and show our stuff. So um, I think that what I have found is really important with us, especially around vulnerability, is splitting time between like working and figuring out logistics and like really just kicking it with each other and like getting to know each other. That like our relationship is not only about productivity um, and, you know, being in this space of 
you know, I got to be putting these things out and that really distorting like a sense of worthiness or like just it can mess with your mental health, you know, so we we try to make space to really just kick it with each other um, and get to know each other, which I feel like contributes to strengthening this sense of comfort. It like opens up your heart, you able to access and see different angles to things. Um, it's it's this kind of economy of relationships and um, building with each other on that heart level that I think really motivates all that we're able to do together and and really help um, shift this narrative around what heals us as a as a collective organizing unit. Um, and then just thinking about um, like we definitely reject that model where there's a CEO that makes you know six times more than than like the for doing a quarter of the work that someone who's lower rank does in a hierarchical model. Like, no, you know, we're going to figure out how to split this out equitably and evenly. And so sometimes it might be that someone's project is taking up more energy. And so how do we balance that out through the next wave? And, and that like, it's not always going to be an e like this sort of picture perfect equal pie, but over the course of our relationship, how do we create harmony with what we're doing? And sometimes it'll be a really intense demand rush to get something done. And sometimes it'll be a smoother kind of fluid process and development towards something. Um, so yeah, I, I think we very much are figuring out how to build on like being a collective of collectives and so that like our work doesn't exist in a vacuum and similar to what you were getting at rihanna just around like you know it's not just the three of us in this collective we bring in the whole neighborhood and and it's like the whole neighborhood that is making this film um and so with the kind of healing spaces that we steward and 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 really call up and change our narrative power around what heals us it's like there are so many dope movement-based healing justice kind of groups out there it's important that we feel connected and are serving each other that there's like enough for us all to eat and and that we need each other um so i just wanted to add that that piece especially around um just how these collective leadership models make more room for consent, um, for vulnerability, which for me is, is a portal to liberation and can just like really um, create just a more magical creative experience. Um, so yeah, I'll pause there. Oh, just breathing in all of that. Um, I wanted to just uplift a few um, quotes from each of y'all that have um, stuck with me in our um, previous discussions outside of the panel, where um, Mikael, you shared that because um, Ruth Story Films operates in a way where it also like, I mean, when you shared that y'all do everything in house, um, I think a lot of times when I think about collective uh, work, I feel like it lays a foundation to not operate from scarcity, but ab abundance, because we just know we got each other. We, we we have nothing to lose but our chains, right? We, 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 we got each other and we can do whatever we need to do. And so even though you were talking about kind of like, you know, just production, you do it in house, but that's kind of like what I heard. Um, and uh, you said that because of that, um, it uh, allows you to like breathe more into your principles. Um, so you don't, you know, you're not having to, um, you know, I guess in a general production company or like a non hierarchical production company, perhaps like you're relying on um, um, if you're outsourcing or I, I don't want to talk more into that, but I, I, if you want to elaborate more on that, that just really like uh, stuck with me in terms of, um, 
having what you need so you can actually breathe more into your principles and practice um like can actually focus on the work right um because the values that you already share that shared values also um something um um rihanna had mentioned that like you know just that it, it it's a culture right a collective being in practice of um you know wanting to lift it like being in the practice of lifting everyone we're rising together and um it allows allows you to be yourself right and we're creating a space where everyone can be their full selves um and then um jazz you had mentioned like just the layer of like caring um it's that when you're doing work like this it's not product oriented it's about each other and we caring about that thread and the ties um and i think a lot of the time we are forced to um you know be product oriented um in a hierarchical structure but when you dismantle that it's about the people so it's about what like you said like everyone's opinion right so um what do we all want and that allows us to care about what we all want together um so just wanted to lift up those things y'all shared um as we all you all were thinking i i'm wondering that perhaps folks who are listening um a lot of a lot of the times the question comes that yes all these values are great and like it's it's beautiful to hear the practice how it's, it looks in practice and uh, especially most of us who are here um come from come with marginal marginalized identities um it's not always possible um like for me you know it, it's as much as i i'm passionate about volunteering it's not always easy to do volunteer work so how does like the big question about money right how do we financially sustain ourselves in a collective structure and i think where the time is 4 10 the panel is supposed to end at 4 15 we have got five minutes i don't know if you any of you have um just a brief like uh, comment about that. Um, I, I feel like it's a whole another panel to talk about that. Um, but if you have any thoughts around that. Uh, the struggle is real. Okay, um, I I am doing film um, full time. It's the primary way that I am, you know, keeping some a, a, a few little scattered crumbs on the plate and a roof over my head. Um, and one of the things that has been helpful in our collective is to be very frank about why are we working with whom? What does this enable us to do? What is working with these sorts of clients um, on? x kind of client with y kind of project um enable us to do and what does it not enable us to do right and so if we are thinking about partnerships strategically um of course informed by the lens of our principles then um we can get a little bit better lay of the land for all right if we work with this client doing this then this will give us enough resources to do this it doesn't always have to be the same person or the same type of collaboration for the same reasons. Each collaboration can have a different purpose. And um, it's been helpful not to feel like, well, you know, going left today means we have to go left every day, right? Left meaning just going one direction, not like you're going left and doing whack stuff. Um, but just thinking about how different opportunities enable you or disenable you to do different things um and being frank and okay with that like what are we going to get from this it's not going to pay a lot of money but you know we get to build some great relationships we get to support a great cause and so that's been helpful um just to think about it in in that layer way it doesn't answer all the questions or solve all the problems but but that's been helpful 
And I'm just going to say to piggyback off of that, as a collective, we sometimes have to tell each other that we can't create our dream projects. We can't create the project that's our passion project. You have to create a project that's thorough, that you know is going to do the numbers that you need to get the funding that you need. You have to put your dreams to the side to create something that's going to bring in revenue. And even though that's not ideal, that's what we do as a collective so that our stories are still told. Because there's a lot of stories that's going, people are dying with stories, right? People are going to die with their stories. They, we can't afford to make them. And in this world and in, in, in this time, some of us do have to work outside of film. I wasn't always doing film full time. And once I was doing the nine to five, well, 12 to 12 film, that's even worse, right? Because like you, you're working on someone else's dream. So, but sometimes that's how it goes. You have to fund your dream through everybody else's dream. And then you, outside of that, when you do start creating, you have to start asking for people to believe into your believe in your projects. And that just means putting out great work. That means being consistent, telling great stories. And as a collective, that's pretty much what we believe in. You put your best work first, your dream passion, your dream project is gonna have to come later when you get the funds. And that's just how it goes. I'm also a fan of like raise them rates. Okay. Ask for the bread. Let okay. them tell you no. Don't tell yourself no. Right? Don't tell yourself no. Let them tell you no. Raise them rates. Raise them. Yes, indeed. Right. Um, I, I'm going to be brief, too. I think, uh, you know, as a, a collective of people who curates films, um, it's really important for us, too, to have uh, dialogue. And I forgot to say that, and I think it's really important um, so I think a large focus for us is to bring um, what Rihanna was saying, other people from the community into the rooms to have conversations um, about the images and the subject matter that they're seeing. Because, it, you know, you, you very often through social media, you, you end up in an echo chamber. So you're hearing and seeing the same things all the time. But when you open up your... Um, you know, you're a theater or a community space to uh, the public, you get all kinds of folks coming in telling you all these different things. So you get multi-directional conversation um, instead of the echo chamber. And I think that's a, that's a value that, uh, that I really value about Petois, um, so. Thank you all so much. I think we're at time. Um... Yeah, and just to add to that a little bit before we end is, um, I think like right now in the folks who are here, there are two production company collectives, one film festival, UFC is, um, you know, advocacy artist development, doing advocacy artist development work and um, mutual aid and a mental health art collective. And we're all, um, you know, I, I think it's, it's, it's that principal value that um, brought us to do the work in this way. And there are alternative, um, you know, I, I feel like the money struggle is, is everywhere in a hierarchical structure, non-hierarchical structure, but here our soul is nourished, right? And, um, you know, like I think uh, four of the collectives here are actually financially sustaining ourselves and we're finding ways, we're constantly exploring within this within this structure, how can we create alternative pathways to financially sustain ourselves? And um, so, yeah, um, but I think we are uh, open to close here. Thank you all so much for sharing space with us.